back, beloved. We are on the book of Daniel, chapter 9. Today we are going to be finishing up this glorious prophecy. I've subtitled this, The Messiah and the Prince to Come. And so we're going to go over those today. Now before we jump back into Daniel, chapter 9, verse 26, the way I finished the last video was I did a quick 90-second breakdown of cha uh, verses 24 and 25. I, I finished with a quick review. I'm going to play that right now, that way just to get you up to speed, and then we're going to jump right back in. Seventy weeks, seventy sevens, 490 years have been decreed for your people and your holy city, the Jewish people and Jerusalem, to finish the transgression, idolatry, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity. It's what the Messiah did when he was cut off. To bring in eternal righteousness, the righteousness of the ages, to seal up, fulfill vision and prophecy. It's all done. The perfect's here. And to anoint the most holy place in the millennial temple of Ezekiel 40 to 48. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree, a word to restore and rebuild the temple, no, <laughs> not the temple, Jerusalem, just like Nehemiah said, until Messiah, the prince, until the anointed prince. We know Jesus from Isaiah 9 is the prince of peace. There will be seven weeks, 49 years, and during that time, uh, Jerusalem was rebuilt with plaza and moat, and the Old Testament canon and scriptures, you know, stopped, and, and the people went back to Jerusalem. 60, and then 62 weeks, 434 years, for a total of 483 years, it will be built again. Now, there's a missing week. We're going to talk about that next week. This is 69 years where Jerusalem's rebuilt, and the Messiah comes. And after those 62 weeks, the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, is killed, and he has nothing. He's killed not for himself. He's killed for the sins of his own people. All right, and thank you for watching that. So now we are in Daniel 9, verse 26. The 62 weeks have come. The Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And remember, we have dated that to the triumphal entry. I believe that Sir Robert Anderson in his calculations is correct, that the day, uh, it, literally this prophecy predicts the exact day Jesus rode into Jerusalem. You remember many times in the gospel, Jesus said, you know, it's not my time. It's not my time. It's not my time. It wasn't his hour yet. You can see that again and again and again. But when that day came, he presented himself publicly. It was his time and he did not reject the worship that people gave him. And so I don't just believe that because of, of Sir Robert Anderson's math. Now that we've laid out the most likely and orthodox time frame based on the years and the days and the weeks, now this prophecy starts to unravel. We can go a little bit quicker. It is mesmerizing and amazing. We don't have to do so much math. And so now that we, it really, I believe from scripture, I'm going to show you when Jesus wrote in on his triumphal entry, I think Jesus recounts everything in Daniel chapter nine. Like you're going to see that in a second. Everything Jesus talks about like during and right after his triumphal entry is from Daniel chapter 9. That's why I believe Sir Robert Anderson's math is correct, not simply for, you know, just the, the solid work of the math, I guess you could say. And so the Messiah will be killed. He'll have nothing. Look at this. This is incredible. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city, that's Jerusalem, the one they had been building and they rededicated it, and the sanctuary, and the temple. And its end, Jerusalem's end, will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. There's times in scripture where like armies are described as like overflowing like a flood. And then it says desolations are determined. That word desolate, the destruction of Jerusalem and trouble for the Jewish people, that's determined. Beloved, this is one of the most clearest historical prophecies in Scripture, and Jesus echoed it when he came hundreds and hundreds of years after Daniel. You see, when the Messiah was cut off, when he was killed, that ended the 69 weeks. 35 years after Christ died. So you see, there's this gap. After the 62 weeks, there's a gap. And Christ is killed, 
And the people of the prince who is to come destroy the city and the sanctuary. You're going to see this in a second. Jesus prophesied the destruction of the temple. He said there won't be one stone left. That was done by the Romans, the iron of Daniel chapter 2 and the fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7. The people of the prince who is to come, the prince who is to come is the coming final, I believe, the one day Antichrist. They will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and they did. Its end did come like a flood. The soldiers flooded it during war. There was a siege. Desolations were determined. You're going to see Jesus use that exact word, desolate, when he rode in. And, and the reason I believe this prophecy is pointing towards the triumphal entry of Christ is because Jesus echoes pretty much everything in this prophecy as soon as he enters Jerusalem. You have to remember the triumphal entry, beloved, is illuminated and prophesied in Scripture uh, heavily. And I want to bring this up. If Daniel 9 is talking about the triumphal entry, so clearly is Zechariah 9. Look at this, Zechariah 9, about you know four or 500 years before Christ is born. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. That's Jerusalem. Shout in triumph, daughter of Jerusalem, the citizens, the inhabitants. Behold, your king is coming to you, the Messiah, the king. He's just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus rode into Jerusalem to fulfill this prophecy. It's written in the book of Matthew. He did that to fulfill this prophecy. He came in humble, riding on a donkey. So here's another prophecy pointing us to the triumphal entry. And beloved, this section of scripture, when Jesus rides in during the triumphal entry on, on the colt, on the foal of a donkey, I believe this section of scripture I'm about to read you so illuminates and explains the prophecy of the 70 weeks of Daniel that even if I didn't have Sir Robert Anderson's calculation and I only could guess around a rough time frame of Jesus's ministry, I would still say this is what it was pointing to. And, and I'm going to explain why. This is incredible. As he, Jesus, is going, as he's riding into Jerusalem on that donkey, to the triumphal entry where he's, it's his hour. He's presenting himself as the Messiah publicly. They were spreading their coats on the road. All the Israelites that would kill him in a few days. As soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen. Beloved, they had 400 years of divine silence. They had the exact time frame the Messiah would come. Then in that time frame, John the Baptist comes as a fiery preacher preparing the way. Jesus comes. They all saw the miracles. It's incredible. And this is what they shout. This shout is a fulfillment of Psalm 118. I will bring this up. This shout is a fulfillment of a messianic prophecy. I'm going to show it to you in a minute. They shout, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees and the self-righteous zealots, right? They, they said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Stop them from praising you. And Jesus said, I tell you, if they became silent, this is amazing, the stones would cry out. Because I believe this was the day prophesied in Scripture, in Zechariah 9, in Psalm 118, in Daniel 9, the day the Messiah was revealed and worship was due him this day. And so if the people shut their mouths, the stones would cry out because the eternal God had decreed worship and Scripture cannot be broken. And so when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city. He saw Jerusalem. It, the, the Daniel 9 predicts that Jerusalem would be destroyed. Let's go back to it just, just really quick. This is, a, this is incredible. The people of the prince who is to come, the Roman, destroy the city and the sanctuary during war. They come in like a flood during war. Look at this. This is so illuminating of this text, especially with Sir Robert Anderson's math pointing to the exact day. The stones will cry out. He sees the city, he sees Jerusalem, and he weeps over it. And this is what he said. This is incredible. If you had known in this day the things which make for peace, because war is coming, and Jesus, he understands God is sovereign. He is God in human flesh. 
but he also weeps over Jerusalem for their hardness of heart. He says, now they've been hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you. This is right out of Daniel 9. The days will come upon you. Your enemies will throw up a barricade against you, surround you, and hem you in on every side. Beloved, this happened 35 years after Christ died. Flavius Josephus, a non-believer in Christ, historically recorded this. This is just known in history whether you believe the Bible or not. This is just a clear prophecy Jesus made. It came true. He said, they will level you to the ground and your children within you, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because this is amazing. And and in Matthew, he predicted the destruction of the temple. So the, the temple, and here he's predicting the siege and destruction of the city of Jerusalem. Daniel 9 mentions the siege and destruction of them both by the Roman people. He says, this is why this destruction is coming on you. You did not recognize the time of your visitation. Beloved, this is incredible. Don't you understand? Daniel 9 revealed the city would be destroyed and the temple would be destroyed, how they would be destroyed, and the time frame they would be destroyed. And Jesus echoes all these prophecies at the triumphal entry, the exact moment it looks like it was prophesied he would come. And he says, if only you had known, it breaks his heart. They've rejected their Messiah. They've had hundreds of years to study the prophecies. They've seen the miracles. You did not recognize the time of your visitation. Not that you rejected the miracles, not that you just rejected his preaching. God had revealed to them the time of Christ's visitation. Beloved, there's one more section of scripture I need to explain to you. Psalm 118 is written roughly a thousand years before Jesus is born. It is a messianic psalm. Jesus quoted this psalm as a messianic psalm. The New Testament clearly says this is messianic prophesying of the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. Look at these verses. It says, this is the gate of the Lord. The righteous will enter into it, uh, enter through it. Jesus said in John 10, I am the gate. Anyone who enters through me will be saved, okay? It says, the stone which the builders rejected, the Jewish people built the temple. He's become the chief cornerstone. They rejected their own Messiah. They rejected their own creator. They rejected Christ. Even though they built the temple, they rejected the God of the temple. They rejected the chief cornerstone. It says, this is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous. This is the day which the Lord had made. This is very important. It starts to talk about a day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice. Let's be glad in it. Oh, Lord, save, send prosperity. Beloved, during the triumphal entry, this is the exact sentence they utter. They say, this is an amazing messianic prophecy. When you understand this, your heart will sing. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. That's what they said to fulfill the prophecy of Psalm 118. The one who comes in the name of the Lord is Jesus. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. They were in front of the temple and doing this. And beloved, if they had just looked at their own scripture, the very next sentence, it says, if Jesus walks in and fulfills scripture in real time, we've blessed you. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Look at the next verse. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Jesus said, I am the light of the word. What are the very next words? Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. Just like Daniel 9 predicted the Messiah would be killed, Psalm 118 predicted they would say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the Messiah. He is the sacrifice that was bound to the horns of the altar It is incredible when you line up all these and you realize during the triumphal entry, Jesus mentions the destruction of the city. He mentions the destruction of the temple and he says, you didn't understand the time of your visitation. And so now after all those glorious truths about Christ and his prophecies concerning his first coming uh, and, and even his second coming a little bit, we now move on to eschatology. Daniel 9.27 talks about the Antichrist. And this is actually a common theme in scripture that we have prophecies concerning Jesus Christ and prophecies concerning Antichrist 
side by side. We need to understand the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth, truth about Christ and truth about the Antichrist. Anything scripture reveals is for the saints. And so here's just one example. In Zechariah chapter 11, we hear of the shepherd of Israel, you know, who is sold for 30 shekels of silver. It is a prophecy of Christ who was sold for 30 shekels of silver, written for 430, 500 years before he was born. But right after that in Zechariah, a foolish shepherd is raised up because they rejected the good shepherd. And it is a clear prophecy in Zechariah 11 of the Antichrist. It's very similar in Daniel 9. We have all these prophecies about Christ, and then the people of the prince who is to come. The Roman people destroy the city and the sanctuary, and then he makes a firm covenant. I believe the Antichrist will make a covenant with Israel, and, and possibly with many nations around the world, for one week, that is seven years. But in the middle of the week, that's the middle of seven is three and a half years. He will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. I believe this covenant will have to do with peace in the Middle East. Beloved, we live in amazing times. Israel became a nation again in 1948. They conquered Jerusalem in 1967. But the sovereign nation of Jordan controls the Temple Mount, and there's much infighting over it and a lot of political gambling and all sorts of things over the Temple Mount and the Temple. And the Jews want to rebuild their Temple right now. I believe this firm covenant might have something to do with sacrifice and grain offering because in the middle of the week, he stops this sacrificial system and grain offering. Well, why does he stop it? I believe the New Testament shows clearly he stops it because he wants to be worshipped alone. You see, the Antichrist is going to come in with intrigue. He's going to be a political genius. He's going to solve all these problems that for millennia looked like nobody could solve. He'll probably get the Jews and the Muslims and Catholics and everyone to kind of agree on, you get this much Temple Mount, we get that much Temple Mount. He's going to actually cut a deal that people agree to. And he's probably going to be looked at as a, well, he's definitely going to be looked at as a savior of the world. He's going to be a false Jesus. But in the middle of the week, he stops the sacrifice and grain offering. And then it says on the wing of abominations, most people take that as on the wing of the temple comes one who makes desolate. It's talking about the person, the one. I think it's the New Testament's Antichrist, the man of sin. It says he's the son of destruction. And he comes until a complete destruction. One that is decreed is poured out, kind of like at the end of Revelation, the fifth bowl, the bowls of wrath are poured out on the earth. And the fifth bowl is poured out on the Antichrist and his kingdom, and it becomes dark. And it's poured out on the one who makes desolate. <clears throat> Beloved, I'm going to start just basically teaching you about the abomination of desolation that Jesus talked about, because I, I need to explain it to illuminate this final verse. You see, Daniel chapter 11, we're going to talk about this in a few weeks. It talks about, it says, they will set up, 11 verse 31, the abomination of desolation. Scripture has an abomination of desolation, and the Jewish people historically recognize that abomination of desolation. It came roughly 164 years before Christ was born. It was Antiochus Epiphanes desecrating the sanctuary, the temple, and he went. He he did away with the regular sacrifice. He was a foreshadowing of the coming final Antichrist. So Scripture clearly reveals in the book of Daniel that an abomination of desolation has already happened in the past in one sense, in a lesser fulfillment. It's kind of like King David was a foreshadowing of Jesus, right? He was a shepherd, and then he became a king of Israel, and Jesus is called the greater David. It's almost like Antiochus Epiphanes and him destroying the temple, and he set up an idol of Zeus. Antiochus Epiphany set up an idol of Zeus and he slaughtered a pig and he, you know, butchered the Jewish people. I went over that in Daniel chapter 8. That was, in a sense, a lesser Antichrist, a lesser abomination of desolation. When we get to the New Testament, it talks about the man of sin, the son of destruction. He exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship. He doesn't set up an idol of Zeus or some other God. 
he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. The image of the beast, the image of the Antichrist Revelation talks about, he wants to be worshipped as God. So it's even worse than what Antiochus did. Beloved, Jesus uses that word. He's talking to Jerusalem. He says, you killed your prophets, you stoned them. He says, your house is being left to you desolate. This is right after the triumphal entry, probably the day after Jesus rode in, and he begins his Olivet Discourse. That's much of what we know about Bible prophecy, about eschatology, about the study of end times. And he looks at the temple and he says, I tell to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. He prophesies the destruction, just like in Daniel 9, 26, right? The people of the prince who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. He then goes on to talk about, this is really illuminating. This is how you know Antiochus Epiphanes couldn't have been the final fulfillment of the abomination of desolation because that happened like 160 years before Christ is born. Jesus begins to talk about, you know, the tribulation and horrible times. And he says, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then flee Judea, then get out. That Antichrist from Daniel 9, 27, he comes in with a firm covenant. First Thessalonians 5 actually says, when they say peace and safety, then, and they as non-believers, then come sudden destruction. The whole world's going to think we found peace in the Middle East, we found peace in the world, everything's going great, the, the false messiah, the Antichrist, has brought about a time of peace, which the true messiah, Jesus, was prophesied to do, right? In the middle of that, he puts a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. Well, why? You know, in the Old Testament, it's like, well, why? He's going to set up in idol. And Jesus says in Matthew 24, verse 15, the abomination of desolation wasn't just what Antiochus Epiphanes did. It will be at the time of the end. He says, during that time, for then there will be a great tribulation, uh, such a great tribulation, such a great time of trouble. Daniel 12 uses this exact terminology, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. It will be the absolute worst time in human history. And so it, it wasn't the Roman siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD, because only about a million Jews died. It wasn't World War II, uh, even though that was horrible and six million Jews died, and many Gentiles and nations died in World War II, because Christ didn't come back after World War II. There's something coming even worse, and there's going to be a final Antichrist and a final abomination of desolation, a final image of jealousy, if you will. And the Antichrist is going to go into the temple, and he's going to proclaim himself as being God after having a firm covenant with the people of Israel and probably with the nations of the world. And I think it's clear in that covenant they're going to get their sacrificial system back. They're going to think they're moving in the right direction. And then he is going to go in the temple and reveal himself. He's going to say he's Jesus. He's going to say he's God in human flesh. But he will be the Antichrist. And now just very quickly, we're going to sweep through Revelation 11, Revelation 12, and Revelation uh, 13 very, very extremely quickly, just a few verses to finish up this Daniel 9 prophecy because you get the 42 months and you get the temple, you get all these things Daniel 9 is talking about. In Revelation 11, uh, this is after, or I'm sorry, this is right before the seventh trumpet is blown. This is deep into the tribulation, and it could be describing events that are almost at the second coming of Christ, right? This is very deep into the tribulation. And John gets a vision, and someone is measuring the temple of God and the altar. And he says, leave out the court, which is outside the temple. Don't measure it. It's been given to the nations, not the Jewish people, to the Gentiles. They will tread underfoot the holy city, Jerusalem, for 42 months. Beloved, we live in amazing times. This couldn't have been really done 200 years ago. There were no Jews in the holy city. There was no real holy city. Jerusalem's back. Israel's back. The Jews have control of the temple in a sense. You can go to the weeping wall, but the Gentiles have a, a massive control now. And I believe the Antichrist will work out some sort of agreement 
where the Gentiles get some of the temple. They get the court in certain areas, and the Jews get some of the temple. And it says they will tread underfoot Jerusalem, the holy city, for 42 months. And there's going to be two witnesses, two prophets, and it says they prophesy during these 42 months for 1260 days. That's three and a half years, half a week, 42 months of 30 day months. The the Daniel Daniel 9 is clearly being explained in the book of Revelation. You get to so you see and, and then you see the temple there, you see the 42 months, you see the 1260 days. It all becomes clear as we study the book of Revelation and line it up with Daniel. In Revelation 12, you have the woman, which is Israel. I made a Revelation commentary. You can see this. This is clearly talking about Israel. She flees into the wilderness. The the children of God, the true Israelites, the Jewish people at the time of the tribulation, flee into the wilderness to escape the persecution of the Antichrist. God prepares a place so that she can be nourished for 1,260 days. That's half a week. You know, it makes sense. The Antichrist at that half week, that three and a half year, 42 month, 1260 day period, he stops sacrifice and offering. He desecrates whatever the Jews thought their temple was, and he wants to be worshiped as God. He claims probably to be Jesus, right? He, he might claim to be the second coming of Jesus. He might claim to be the first coming of Jesus. I don't know. He will be against the true Jesus and stand in the place of the true Jesus, in a sense. Um, it, it further in Revelation 12 goes on to say, the dragon, the devil, persecuted the woman who, who gave birth to Jesus, essentially. But two wings of a great eagle were given to the woman. The Lord is supernaturally saving Israel during the time of the tribulation. Uh, she flew into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for a time, times and half a time from the presence of the serpent, from the presence of the devil, the Antichrist. You know, Daniel 7.25, when talking about this final coming world ruler who tramples the saints, he blasphemes the Most High, it says he changes the law, right? It says the saints are given into his hand for a time, times and half a time. Time is one. Times is two and half a time. That's three and a half. You get to Revelation 13. It's all about the Antichrist. And he has a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies. He has authority for 42 months. You go down a little further in Revelation 13. What do you have? It was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast, the image of the Antichrist, the final abomination that causes desolation that Jesus warned about during the time of the absolute worst time of all of planet Earth ever, a time such as there never will be again, right? So that the image of the beast uh, would even speak, and, and anyone who doesn't worship this image of the beast is killed. So I think it's very straightforward. He makes a firm covenant with many for seven years. In the middle of the week, he puts a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. It almost implies the covenant has something to do with the Jewish sacrificial system. The New Testament reveals he goes into the temple and proclaims to be God. And so, yes, he's going to stop what they're doing. He's going to come in peaceably and, and have an agreement for everyone to have peace and you all get to keep your religion and they're all going to love this guy and they're going to give him the keys to the kingdoms of the world. They're all going to worship him and everything but actual like you are God worship. And, and they're really going to think he's probably the sweetest, smartest, best man ever. And then all of a sudden in the middle of the week, he is going to commit this abomination and it is going to, he's going to usher in just carnage on a worldwide scale. And so I've tried to keep this eschatology kind of to a 30,000 foot view. I now want to go through and recap the prophecy, all of it, from Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, uh, just so I can really sear it in your mind and then finish with one more quote from Sir Isaac Newton. I think it's really important. So here we go. 70 weeks, 490 years have been decreed for your people and your holy city, the Jewish people, Jerusalem to finish the transgression, culminating in the abomination of desolation, culminating in the image of the Antichrist, the image of the beast, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity. Christ did that on the cross. To bring in eternal righteousness, the righteousness of the ages, seal up vision and prophecy, fully fulfilled the second coming of Christ, 
and anoint the most holy place. I, will believe, uh, I believe that will be the, during the millennial earthly reign of Christ. Ezekiel 40 to 48 dictates a temple after it talks about Christ's coming. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree, a word, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, there will be seven weeks, 49 years, and 62 weeks, 434 years. They're distinct, but they're lumped together as 483 years. It, Jerusalem, will be built again. It will be built with plaza and moat, street and wall, festival corner, just like the book of Nehemiah predicts and, and illuminates and shows us and gives us the decreed time of, of, of the, you know, Artaxerxes, even in times of distress where they wanted to kill them for rebuilding Jerusalem and they had to keep a sword on one hip and a hammer in another to, to continue it. Then after 62 weeks, after the full 483 years, the Messiah will be cut off, killed, but not for himself. He will have nothing. That's Jesus dying on the cross. Then the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the temple 35 years after Christ, just like Christ predicted in the triumphal entry, which this prophecy dictates down to the very day. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Flavius Josephus recorded that the final, the, the Jews were holed up in the temple. That was the final thing there. And the Romans besieged it. They conquered one wall and they flooded in there and destroyed it. And because there was gold in between the bricks of the temple, they tore down every stone, just like Christ predicted. Desolations were determined. And he will make a firm covenant and agreement with many for one week, the final week. There's a gap, and then there's this final seven-year period to come. But in the middle of the week, three and a half, 3.5 is the middle of a seven-year week. Three and a half years, time, times, and half a time, 42 months, 1260 days, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abomination will come one who makes desolate. The Antichrist will go into the temple, proclaim to be God, and want to be worshipped as God. Even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out. The bowls of wrath and all the horrible judgments of the tribulation poured out on the one, the Antichrist, who makes desolate. And so I want to finish. This is the end of the Daniel 9 saga for me. It's three episodes. It's probably about... Two, two and a half hours of total content on Daniel chapter 9. Beloved, I did not even scratch the surface. And I, I, how can a man know his own ways? We don't even know our own heart. There's so much error mixed in with the truth of what I'm trying to teach you. It's not error from scripture. It's error from me. <laughs> and I'm sorry to tell you, but it's just true. I could never get this absolutely perfect. I promise you. I have done the best I can, but I want to finish with a comment from Isaac Newton as I encourage you to continue to study this glorious chapter of the Bible. This is his final comment. He said, about the times of the end, a body of men will be raised up who will turn their attention to the prophecies and insist upon their literal interpretation in the midst of much clamor and opposition, beloved, with all my heart, I love the literal interpretation of Scripture. And I believe many of brothers and sisters in Christ who genuinely love the Lord and are serving Him, they don't like that literal interpretation. Some have spiritualized more than I do, and I think it's important that I receive them in love, even though I disagree with them. Um there is much clamor and opposition to the prophecies of Scripture nowadays. It's out there. A lot of people think all of Revelation was fulfilled. A lot of people think, uh, you know, we don't really know. We have no idea of knowing anything in Daniel and Revelation. It's all a mystery. Whereas I believe God has revealed it to us. He reveals it to us through the Spirit. Believe it or not, I actually believe it's pretty clear. I really believe Bible prophecy is actually quite simple. On a 30,000-foot level, I can't put everything on a time frame for you, but I do believe at the time of the end, people will turn to these prophecies and insist upon their literal interpretation. I would pray the Lord comes back soon, and I do praise up, pray that he raises up this body of men, and I, I hope you've enjoyed these videos on Daniel chapter 9.